without giving an intro. Oh, my gosh. Sorry, guys. Oh. Welcome to the show tonight. <coughs> there will be no intro music. <laughs> I have been trying. For, I've, I've been working hard all day long on the computer. Oh, man. Nonstop. And then right, uh, and I, but I opened up a program that I remembered at the last minute was not compatible with another program, and it caused the computer to crash. But this time I couldn't get it restarted. And after about 10, 15 minutes, I was sitting there trying to figure out how to, how to select the right option on the screen. And Greg just said, just unplug the daggum thing. Start it, give it a hard reset. And I was like, you know what? That's what I'm going to do. And sure enough, it slapped it silly, and now we're back. So that's good. That's good. So w without an introduction, so that's okay, though. Uh, yeah, so how could, how could Paul have possibly been a student of Gamaliel? Did he lie? How could he? How could he? he? Uh, well, it's very interesting. I, I'm shocked by this because, okay, so that's my phone. several phone. things – you cannot check your brain at the door. You have to be a thinking person. And so like Gamaliel is one of the greatest teachers of Israel. And he is the one that is credited in the, in the Christian Bible with saying, Oh, don't go kill them. Be don't go kill the Christians because if what they've started is of Hashem, it will succeed, and what if if it's not from Hashem, then it will fail. And he gives the list of a guy who had tried something before, and it was and it failed. So on this show before, I have stated that when Paul says that he is under the authority of the Sanhedrin to go to Damascus and kill Christians, <laughs> that that is laughable. The Sanhedrin did not have any type of capital function ability at this time in history. And re remember, a Sanhedrin that executed one person in 70 years was known basically as a, a bloody court. Right. So so there's there's no way, no there is a, a Christian, please listen to this. <laughs> there is no way that the Sanhedrin could have given Paul authority to go kill Christians. That is not possible. But think about this for a minute. If Gamaliel is teaching, don't go kill the Christians because we'll let Hashem take care of it. If Paul is a student of Gamaliel, then he's not a very good student of Gamaliel <laughs> because Gamaliel would teach his students what he thinks and he thinks not to kill the Christians. So why would his star pupil Paul be off killing Christians for the very Sanhedrin that Gamaliel is a part of? That's, that's a great question. And that, that's one you've got to ponder when you when you say things like Paul is the word of Hashem, that that just can't be. And there's one other little note because I am going to interact with the with the chat. I'll I'll do that this weekend when this goes <clears throat> on where I can respond. Okay. And of all the responses, and I, I understand that a lot of people just like to see their their thoughts in print, so to speak. That's universal. Everybody likes to see that. Everybody likes to think that they are valued and, and impactful. That's very good. But if you would please, please, I beg of you, make responses to what I posit, okay? Like, like this. If you think I'm wrong about Gamaliel, if you think that the Sanhedrin did have authority to send emissaries into other countries to carry out capital punishment, then you can, you can email me or you can go in the chat and you can show me from historical documents, from from written places, why I am incorrect. 
don't just say Jesus is Lord and you will burn in hell because you try to teach people not to believe in Jesus. Uh, okay. Or, or I can't stand to listen to this guy. He is boring as can be. That's no different oh. than this. That really is no different than imagine an argument with somebody. Somebody says something and the other person says, well, you're fat, you're ugly. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's exactly the same. You're making a statement that's just trying, Correct. that's trying to derail the train of thought of the other person and to dismantle. Yeah. And it doesn't work. Yeah. It's just, it's childish. It really is. It, it's, it's childish. And so let's do each other the honor of responding um, with clear intent. I do not care if you disagree with me. Please understand that. But when you disagree with me, give me a reason. So I, I have a, a lot of interaction with a lot of apologists. And one of the things that's happening now recently is this attack on the, on the Hebrew Bible itself. And I've been told now half a dozen times that the Hebrew Bible has been corrupted. And the rabbis corrupted the Hebrew Bible. This is just uh, almost ad hoc. They just this is just accepted. And so my response is, okay, the Hebrew Bible is corrupted. Who corrupted it? Well, the rabbis did. Okay, when did they corrupt it? Well, you know, it was 1,500 years from the time that it was given to Moses until Jesus. And that, that's about right. I think it's 1460, 1480, somewhere around there, but 1,500 years. And so when Jesus was here, they had to, they had to put in there what it really said, what the Bible really said, what the Hebrew Bible really said. And I said, so who were the Christian scribes and teachers that were that were studiously and effectively bringing the Torah in its original form in say uh, 700 before the Common Era. <laughs> who who were they? How how many Christians were there in 700 BCE? Oh, there were. There were, there were zero. <laughs> How many Christians were there in 100 BCE? There were zero. Right. So, so how, how could Christians who have absolutely zero influence over the Hebrew Bible prior to the birth of Jesus how could they know that it had been corrupted? Were they there at the corrupting? Can they can they tell me what Ezekiel really said? Can they tell me what Moses really said? So there was a comment uh, that's that's probably would be good to be bring, to bring it up right right now. Uh, okay. Just, just in case. So uh, Miriam Levinson says, uh, according to Acts nine one, Paul requested letters from my from a high priest who would have been a Sadducee. To have the Christians arrested, he wasn't sent by a Pharisee of Sanhedrin. Okay, that but well, sure. but the 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 Sadducees are part of the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> the the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes were part of the Sanhedrin. Okay. So okay, so this this kind of makes it worse. Oh, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> do tell. <laughs> be be well. So now, now then, we have only one. Rogue, a, a Sadducee is still a priest. A Sadducee is is still a rabbi. They're just very sad. He just, you see. yeah, they're they're just very sad. You see, <laughs> no, the the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. So that, that's the difference. They still teach Torah. Now there are no Sadducees now, but in in the Sanhedrin they still were they still were rabbis. So so then it's it's kind of even worse. Just one. One man had the authority from to send Paul, who is a student of Gamaliel, to go to a foreign country and kill Christians. 
does uh, again does that <laughs> who has authority to do that now rome had authority to do that nobody in jerusalem had political authority now i guess that you could have had a mob style hit done that 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 would be the only thing that could be that could be left but if paul is a student of gamaliel then why wouldn't he be why wouldn't he know the teachings of gamaliel that we don't go kill these these new these new believers because they're not even called christians the the christians are first called christos at a town called antioch william guess how many towns called antioch there are in asia minor at the time I don't know, but there's one in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the one. So, so the only reference, the only reference in your Christian Bible to the followers of Jesus being called Christos, or that's just the Greek word for, for anointed, the only reference is that they were first called Christos at Antioch. There are four towns in Asia Minor called Antioch. So again, now remember, this is the, this is the real fulfillment of Hashem's word, according to Christians. What, what Hashem has really meant through all the prophets, through all the sages for since Abraham, since, really since Adam. And it culminates in Christianity in the church. But the town where the followers of Jesus are named is unknown. Because if there's four towns all by the name of Antioch, and it doesn't designate which one it is, then it's an anonymous naming. It'd be like, uh, you know, saying... Uh, um, the the way that our our cities got named, they were always named after English cities. And there's a there's an a city named after James in almost every town, in almost every state in the United States. So if you just say that it was in such and such King James town, you're not really telling me anything. You would have to give me the state that it was in. So there are four cities in Asia Minor called Antioch. All we know about the... now, And remember, the naming of the followers of Jesus would have to be a pretty important thing, wouldn't you think? So that's the way it is. And I, I don't believe that Paul... And the there are really smart people watch this show, and I really appreciate you. I don't believe that Paul ever makes the claim that he is a student of Gamaliel that claim is made for him, I believe in the book of Acts, um, that Paul was a student of Gamaliel. Paul doesn't say it himself, but but if the claim is made for him. So, all right, so now remember that, and I'm, I'm going to do some reading here because I do know how this goes. Um, we are We are lazy. I, I'm lazy. Uh, so we're going to go to Galatians. Galatians is absolutely written by Paul. There is no question about it. And we're going to go first to um, verse 14. I'm in my King Jimmy. What, so what, what Galatians, oh, Galatians 3, 14. All right. And this is where we're going to use William's ever expanding knowledge of the Hebrew language. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> spot. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. I, I'm ready. Let's do I'm this. Pos Let's do I'm it. positive. <laughs> I'm positive that you know the word for children. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it starts with a K, doesn't it? Uh, uh, uh no, or, it's B'nai. Like, no. No, there's well, there's offspring, offspring, 
What's the Hebrew uh, word for offspring? Well, seed is zara and 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 zara zara. zara, zara. zara. That's what I that's what okay. I couldn't remember. Gotcha, okay, yeah. Gotcha. So zara. Okay. And you said verse 14, so 14 right? The verse fourteen. Okay, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be not a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, uh, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Okay, this, again, Christian, please don't say how dumb I am, okay? But this is this is ridiculous. So we're going to go very, very, we're going to go straight to the word of Hashem. We're going to go to Genesis. We're going to go to chapter three. We're in my, I'm going to go in my strongs, or in my, my stone now. I guess I'll try to follow along with the King Jimmy. It's okay. Easy. This one is going. You, yeah, that's true. That's that's fine. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Verse. And, verse fifteen. Sorry, oh, chapter later. three, verse fifteen. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will pound your head. You will bite his heel. What's the word there in Hebrew? It would be zara. Zara. Right. Okay. Now we're going to go to chapter 13 of Genesis. And we're going to go to verse 15. For all the land that you see to you will I give it and to your descendants forever. What's the word there? It should be Zara also. I'm looking it up in the Hebrew right now. Zara. Yeah, 13. 13. Yeah. Chapter 13, verse 14. Or chapter 13, uh, verse 15. 15. It is. Your seed eternity. Good call. Sure. There it is. We're, yeah, yeah, we're there. talking to Abraham. Yeah, that's it right there. It's uh, It has okay. a, a yep. double prefix right, and a suffix. Yep. Uh, we're talking to Abraham. Zorak. How many how many people occupied the promised land? Just was it just one person? No. Was that what that's the promise here to Abraham? Right. Abraham to your offspring, your your one offspring Isaac. He's the only one that will inherit the land no obviously it's the descendants this is no different than the word sheep i would never say that there are a bunch of sheeps standing out in the pasture what would i say i would say there is a herd of sheep hmm. would i mean one sheep or would i mean many sheep context determines right right yeah there could be one sheep in the meadow and i would say there is a sheep in the meadow. If there's a whole bunch of sheep, I would say there is a flock or a herd of sheep. Okay? Now we're going to 15, uh, 15, 5. And he took him outside and said, Gaze now toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. Well, of course I can, God, because there's only one star according to Paul. Uh, only if, and he said, so shall your offspring be. 
so shall your seed, your zera, be. How many are involved? It's a whole bunch. There are a lot of them. 16.10, we're all in Genesis. And an angel of Hashem said to her, this is to Sarah, I will greatly increase your offspring and they will not be able to be counted for abundance. How, how many is there there, William? Is there just one or is there many? It seems like there's more than just one. But it'd have to be more than one. 1719. Okay. God said, nonetheless, your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac and I will fulfill my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Israel, yeah. Okay. How many offspring did Isaac have? A lot. Was it just one? No. That's this is again, this is just this is silly. Chapter 22. 17. My dear friends, hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website tanaktalk.com. T A N A C H T A L K. Com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Chapter 22, 17. That I will surely bless you and greatly increase your offspring like the stars of the heavens and like the sand on the seashore and your offspring shall inherit the gate of its enemy. There are many, many. Mm -hmm. Abraham has many offspring. 2460. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, our sister, may you come to be thousands of myriads and may your offspring inherit the gate of its foes. How many offspring did Sarah have? Now remember, this is Sarah. <laughs> right. This is seed. Yeah. She, Sarah, she had many. And by the way, both in both places, to Sarah and to Rebecca, just like in 315, it is the woman's offspring. Both, all three places are the same. There is no Christian apologist who would contend that Sarah and Rebecca only had one offspring or that the that their offspring were conceived without a father. That is the that is the contention of the church that in 315 of Genesis when it says the seed of woman well that means Jesus is coming because He's going to only be the seed of a woman. Then Sarah also did not have intercourse with a man, and neither did <clears throat> neither did Rachel or Rebecca. I mean, neither did Rebecca. Last one, twenty six four. Again to Abr Again, he is swearing to Abraham. I will increase your offspring like the stars of the heavens and I will give your offspring all these lands and the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by your offspring how many offspring did Abraham have of course he had many offspring they could not be counted they were like the stars <clears throat> of the heavens like the sands of the sea so and when I was in the church you read this stuff in Galatians just with with blinders on. Well, yeah, he did say seed. And well, yeah, that's what it means. It means Jesus. This, this is just made up. There is no such thing in the Hebrew Bible as the word 
Seeds, which would be Zeras. There's no place that that word occurs. Now, do you really think that Gamaliel would not have taught his students that in Hebrew, when it says seed, it means offspring, and it means many offspring. I can't imagine that Gamaliel would teach his students that. How could he? That, that would be, he would not be a good teacher if that's what he taught him. And if he taught Paul that there was a word that doesn't exist in Hebrew, i.e. Zeras, then, uh, then Gamaliel would not have been a great teacher because there's no word of Zeras. Now, this brings us to <laughs> this brings us to the next part of this because. In verse 17, and I say, and this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Okay, all you have to do is read this in your King James Bible for yourself, Christian. God, according to the great, oh, and by the way, since, since Pharisees, and I believe Paul is called the Pharisee of Pharisees, by whoever called him that in, in the book of Acts. And in the chat, please, you've got your stuff in front of you. You can look that up. Why is it that Pharisees are bad that didn't believe in Jesus, but cause they're, they're wrong, those Pharisees are wrong, but the Pharisee Paul, he's right. Can, can you tell me why that is? That seems to be a double standard. It's like these latest Christian apologist shows where now all of a sudden they're invoking Rashi and Radak. And, oh, they, you know, they teach. The, the, well, if you're going to bring in the teachings of the great sages of Israel, it's done. But if Paul is this outstanding Pharisee and Pharisees are bad, then why is Paul authoritative? Uh, I, that's that's just a great question, and please respond to that question because that's a real question. And if you tell me a good reason, then yeah, okay, then I'll you know, talk about that. In the in the Hebrew Bible, was the was it a promise? Now again, understand the context in the in the Galatians. What's the promise? Everybody knows what the promise is. The promise is the law of Christ. And Abraham received the promise, all right? Let's see if Abraham received a promise. Go to the 18th chapter of Genesis, verse 17. And Hashem said, shall I conceal from Abraham what I do? Now that Abraham is surely to become a great and mighty nation, and the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. And by the way, <clears throat> the nations of the earth bless themselves by Jewish people all the time. Jewish people have done outstanding scientific, mathematic, uh, biological, everything. The, literally, the children of Israel bless the nations. They are blessed by Israel. Verse 19, for I have loved him because he accepted my promise. Oh, wow, Paul's right. No, no. <laughs> 
for I have loved him because he commands his children and his household after him that they keep the way of Hashem, doing charity and justice in order that Hashem might then bring upon Abraham that which was spoken of him. Hashem is going to keep the commandments of Hashem. I, Abraham, is going to keep the commandments of Hashem. That's not the promise of Jesus. Could, could anybody possibly conflate keeping the Torah and having the promise of Jesus? Hmm. There is nobody that would conflate that. How do we know that that Abraham kept the commandments and not a promise of a Messiah that will come later? We are explicitly told that in the 26th chapter of Genesis, in the fifth verse, that Abraham kept all the commandments, statutes, and ordinances of Hashem. He kept them all. Again, that's an impossibility in the church. Right, right. You can't do that. Even though in the church, in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, Zechariah and Elizabeth also keep all the commandments, statutes, yes. and ordinances, and are blameless before Hashem. Right on. For the Lord. Right on, yeah. Uh, that should be a constant theme against the teachings of the church. Okay, now we get to verse 19 in chapter 3. Verse, and this one... Verse 19 in chapter 3 of... Verse 19 in chapter 3. This one... Of what, literally of, blows my mind. Sorry, Genesis? Uh, no, Galatians. Oh, okay. Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Gotcha, okay. <clears throat> Verse I I had 19. Uh, okay. <clears throat> it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Okay, this, this law was given just, just until the real seed, which is Jesus. This, this law is just given just for a temporary thing until the real seed which is Jesus would come and the law was and it we're going to we're going to read it in the King James because in the King James it's not as clear as what it well in this part of it it was given or ordained by angels i kid you not this is what paul writes paul writes that this was given by angels, if you if you say that it being <clears throat> the the seed that is Jesus is what was ordained by angels, <clears throat> I will direct you to the seventh chapter of Acts, where Stephen specifically says in verse fifty three, "Who have received the law." by the disposition of angels. And he says it further back in the same chapter too, that the law was given, the Torah was given by angels. By angels. William? Yes, sir. Who was the Torah given to the children of Israel by? A guy named... I'm just kidding. Moses, of course, it was Moses. So. What, what, what was that? I can't remember. I, I was, either. I was going to say, what? I was going to say Noah because somebody asked me. So, how many animals <laughs> did Moses put on the ark? <laughs> so, okay. Yes. So the, that's the right. The Torah was given by God to Moses by Hashem yeah. by God to yeah. Moses. We are. Oh, come on, Christian. If you. If you can read Exodus 19, if you can read Exodus 20, let's just, 
Verse 9 of 19, Hashem said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thickness of the cloud so that the people will hear <coughs> as I speak to you. And they will also believe in you forever. Moses related the words to the peop of the people to Hashem. Hashem said to Moses, Go to the people. Then it says in chapter 20, God spoke all these statements saying, I am Hashem, your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. You shall not recognize the gods of others in my presence. Who is speaking? Is it an angel? According to Paul and according to Acts, Stephen's spirit filled. Oh, that's even worse. According to in chapter 7 of Acts, the Spirit of God is speaking through Stephen. And Stephen says that the Torah was given by angels. Paul says the Torah was given by angels. That's why it's not as <clears throat> important as the law given by Jesus, as the... Yeah. the the promise given by Jesus. One, one thing that I am wondering, and I, I'll tell you this, I am a lot less arrogant of a person since I listen to good rabbis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more, and I, I probably, when I, when I debate with Christian apologists and they get really upset, I, I'm probably a little less aggressive than I should be, but how in the world can you, if, if you're, if you're going to be a humble person and, and Hashem calls us to be humble people, how could you possibly say that the Torah is less important than the promise of the law of Jesus. How, how could you do that? And if you're going to say that, that you're under the direction of the Holy Spirit, how could the Holy Spirit possibly say, which in your Christian Bible is God, how could the Holy Spirit get that wrong? Right. That angels gave the Torah. When all you have to go, in a King James Bible, it says that God gave the Torah. It doesn't say that angels gave the Torah. So I, oh my gosh, I just, I, I can't, I cannot get, I cannot get this out of my head. Then we go down and again, this is Galatians. This is Paul's, this is probably Galatians is one of his, remember Paul does pretty much, he does all the theology for Christianity. Most all of it, the, the gospels, contribute very little as far as theology goes. Go down to verse 23 of Galatians chapter 3. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When Paul says that, the now get what Paul is saying here, don't he does not mince words. One thing I like about this is that Paul he makes it real clear. We only had the Torah until we get Jesus. Very clear. If you come across away from this and you don't get that, then I'm sorry I cannot help you. I like one thing Rabbi Singer said, um, which I, I use it still frequently. 
And that is, if a person is coming to me and they're telling me that they believe that Jesus is the Messiah uh, because of a telephone pole in their front yard, then fine, believe what you want. But don't, <laughs> exactly. but don't tell me you believe he's the Messiah because of what's written in the prophets. Then we have a problem. Correct. We have a huge problem. And again, Christianity is, I think it's unique because other world religions do not claim <clears throat> that they are the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible. And that is Christianity's claim, that they are fulfillment right. of the Bible. Now, <clears throat> let's, and, and this, try to, try to focus here, because remember, Paul is a student of one of the greatest Torah teachers that Israel had, Gamaliel. <clears throat> and Gamaliel taught him that we only have the Torah until faith in Jesus comes. And once faith in Jesus comes, there's no more Torah. That is the clear teaching of Galatians chapter 3. You cannot get away from this, Christian. I'm sorry. And in the church up until our latest, and it, it is interesting because there's this kind of like turning towards the Hebrew Bible. You know what I mean? This Galatians chapter 3, when I was a young man, was pounded from the pulpit. <laughs> because those that dirty law is no more. It's gone. It's done. It's kaput. If you want to cling to your law, then you'll die in your law. And my gosh, the fire the the fiery preachers just pounded that. Jimmy Swagger pounds it today. You can watch his son and grandson pound it today. Let's see what the Torah has to say about itself. We go to chapter 29 of Deuteronomy. Now remember, <clears throat> we were just told by Paul that we're we're shut up. We're kept under the law. We're shut up. We're, we're like slaves to the law. <clears throat> you say Deuteronomy 29? Deuteronomy 29. Go to verse 8. Okay. You mm -hmm. shall observe the words of this covenant mm -mm. so that you will succeed... <clears throat> Hold on. In you all that you do. Deuteronomy 29, verse 8. 20, verse 8, yeah. Uh -uh. You shall. Are you, are you reading out of your. Are you I'm reading? in. Oh, I'm in my stone. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. so it's one verse off, probably, then. Let's see. It'd be seven or nine, maybe. Oh, yeah, it's verse uh, 9. And my stone is, is verse 8. Yeah, it's. It, okay, so keep there for the words. I'm still not sure. Hey, hey, viewer of the show, if you want to write in and tell me why so many of the verses in the Torah are different than the verse numbers in the Christian Bible, please feel free to tell me that, because I still don't know that. Well, they, you, sh you yeah. shall, ob 29, 8, Great. you shall observe the words of this covenant so that you will succeed in all you do. Wow. That doesn't sound like you are shut up. Chapter 30 of the exact same book of Deuteronomy, verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today, it is not hidden from you. Like the Christian Bible says, remember in the Christian Bible, this is all a mystery. Hashem disagrees. It's not a mystery. It's not hidden. It's not distant. It's not in heaven for you to say who can ascend to heaven for us and take it for us so that we can listen to it all and perform it. Nor is it across the sea for you to say, who can cross to the other side of the sea for us and take it for us so that we can listen to it and perform it. Rather, the matter is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart to perform it. See, I have placed before you today the life and the good and the death and the evil. That which I command you today to love Hashem, your God, to walk in his ways, to observe his commandments, his decrees, his ordinances, 
then you will live and you will multiply and Hashem your God will bless you in the land to which you come to possess it. Mm. Wow. That is a lot <clears throat> different than what Paul says the law is. Yeah, right. Would you agree or disagree? Man, that's awful. He says, he says that the law was only given and you're shut up under that law. And it's just a schoolmaster. That's all it is. It's a schoolmaster just to kind of, and when, when he says, I get this, because we had a teacher in the sixth grade. He had a big old yardstick. And he would smack your hands if they were on your desk. With it. <laughs> That's the schoolmaster. Whack, whack. Like the church lady in Saturday Night Live. Crack, crack. <laughs> not that I ever watched Saturday Night Live because that would not be allowed. <laughs> <laughs> So that's funny. Again, how do you, how can Paul be a student okay. of a great Torah teacher? Somebody just said in chat, and and I get it. Robert Cummins says it was like training wheels, but the problem is training, training wheels. Yeah. Tra training wheels is there to teach you to keep writing, not to stop writing. Not to stop writing. Hey, that's right? a great point. That's a great so, point, William. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Try. That's that is wonderful. I have my moments. <laughs> you have your you have many of your moments. Well, thank Just, you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you do. You I do. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um so let's go. We we are okay. I've got next week's show. It's going to be a continuation of this. Okay, do you, do you gonna, do you have time tonight to answer one question before we go? Sure, yes. Let's do you want that now or do you want to finish up what you want to kind let's, of button up your thought first? Let's do that question right now. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to go back up to it. So, uh what uh it says what do we disagree of the things that Jesus actually said himself? What do we disagree with on the things that Jesus actually said himself? Said, said I'm going to, I'm going to add did also. Said or did. <clears throat> okay. Like cursing okay, like I cursing the fig tree was an example. Disagree. Vehemently disagree. This is probably the most famous and I think this should be this is the all-encompassing saying of Jesus according to the gospels. I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes unto the Father except by me. That makes him what? And I just had a, uh, I had a long diatribe with a Christian apologist. What does that make Jesus? If I can only come to the Father through Jesus, that makes him a mediator. Yep. Okay, we are explicitly told and again okay let's not conflate mediator with intercessor all right moses was an intercessor okay he he interceded with hashem on behalf of the children of israel a mediator is a person, and in Job chapter 9, verse 33, read it for yourself, Job explains exactly what a mediator is. When he says there is no mediator between me, Job, and Hashem, a person who can lay his hands on both of us and bring us to agreement, that is a mediator. Again, I have been in my life in mediation. The mediator was above both of us. His, his role was to put his hand, so to speak, on each of us and bring us to an agreement. Who is the person that is powerful enough to put his hand on? on the top of Hashem's head and bring me to agreement with Hashem. <laughs> hmm. Who is that? That's what a mediator does. An intercessor, I, there are people who have interceded for me. Uh, there, there are people in my hometown church who are interceding for me right now. 
they're interceding in the wrong way, but they are, they are on my behalf praying for me because I abandoned Jesus. And I am positive that there are rabbis that are also interceding for me because they're just, they're just like, okay, thank you. We're going to intercede with Hashem with you. I, I know they do. So that is the number one thing that Jesus himself said. Again, do I think that Jesus said that he is Hashem? No, I don't. He did not. Number one, the the yud, the hey, the vav, and the hey do not appear in the Christian Bible because it's freaking written in Greek. There is, and I've had very smart Christian apologists tell me that, oh, that's the Greek name for the Tetragrammaton. William, yes. is there a Greek Tetragrammaton? No, sir. No, there is not a Greek Tetragrammaton. That is why in the Christian Bible, I love to read it in, the, in my stone edition because when the prophets are speaking, they say, thus says Hashem, master of legions. <laughs> the, uh, throughout, right. master of legions, and so in the in the Christian translation of of the old of the Hebrew Bible, it usually says, "Thus saith the Lord," "Thus saith Hashem," and and it, they'll have Lord capitalized, which is their Christian designation for the Tetragrammaton. Nowhere in your Christian Bible does it say, "Thus saith." Hashem. Thus saith the Tetragrammaton. There is no place in your Christian Bible where right. it says that. Right. Do you know why there's no place in your Christian Bible that it says that? Because Hashem did not speak it. And if you say, well, Jesus is really God. And so when Jesus says, I say unto you, you can't count that because there is no name in your Hebrew Bible of Jesus or of Yeshua that is equivalent to the Tetragrammaton. Right. The Tetragrammaton right. is unique. And I get so tired of this. I, I, every rabbi readily concedes that Hashem has titles. Yeah. That is universally understood. It's not meant to confuse. It's meant to clarify when Hashem speaks to us as the God who says stop okay yeah rabbis understand what that means heck I even understand what that means when when he speaks to us as the one who sees okay we understand that that doesn't mean that it's a separate person of the Godhead. That doesn't mean that. Hashem, every time in the, in the Hebrew Bible when the word Hashem appears, that is the tetragrammaton. That is the yud, the hey, the vav, and the hey. And they try and to is, say that that's Jesus and stuff, but I mean, really, realistically, no. the tetragrammaton is is also... Uh, it's kind of an acronym. It's a usage of four different letters that have that really break down the three Hebrew yes, words. Yes, do, do this, do this, do so this, do this, do this, because this is great. There's three words uh, for the past, present, and future. I, I am, I was, I will be. And it's Haya, uh, Hove, and Yie. And those, the, the Yud and the He and the Vav, those three letters are all in that. And it's all basically... God is declaring in his own name that I am the past, present, and future. That's kind of kind of an easy way to remember how that name is yes. constructed. And that that is never ever known or taught in a church. Never. Yeah, see, that Jesus, would never be. Jesus is in the past, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Jesus is the past. Jesus <clears throat> is what 
God created everything through uh, according to the you know, first you, chapter. You know what I God. found in, in, in our last, was it last show or the show before last? Uh, something that came out that I don't think I noticed and, and I know somebody else actually brought it up was they say, well, well, Jesus and Hashem, they're one. and But then you go back and look at all of the angels, all the names of the angels and they have L in them. You know, Correct. the Jesus name was never said anything with L yeah. in it at all. And yeah. I was like, oh right. my yeah. gosh, that is so oh, huge. Yeah. <laughs> that is so huge. Yeah. Wow. That, that is huge. And I mean, Yahashua is a very common Hebrew name. The The son of Nun was Yahashua. Um, he, he was a he was the prophet that arose after Moses that was like Moses. We are explicitly told in the book of Joshua that he is the fulfillment of Exodus 23, that he is the prophet that is like unto Moses. Explicitly, you are literally told that, that Yahashua, son of Nun, or Joshua, son of Nun, in the Christian Bible, in the Christian translation of the Hebrew Bible, he is the prophet like unto Moses. Right. Literally says that. Literally says that. Is that in that. 32? No, where is that? Josh, that's in 30. Joshua, th uh, Joshua 3. Yeah, honestly, you know what? Here, you want to hear something cool? You're the first person who actually showed me that. And I was like, oh my gosh, it literally does say that right there. <laughs> it, it literally oh my Lord. says that. Wow. And they say Jesus yeah. was the prophet like unto Moses. Oh yeah, my God. yeah. That's so uh, Joshua chapter 3. Hashem said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel that they may know that just as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. You man, that's so crazy. Man, man, <laughs> and wow. Since I got my paper master clicker, uh, that is the fulfillment. This is in well, it's in Deuteronomy. Uh then in 18 uh verse 17, then Hashem said to me, they have done well in what they have said. I will establish a prophet for them from among their brethren like you, and I will place my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them everything that I will command him. And Deuteronomy 34, then right near the end of Moses' life, it'd be 34, 9, 34 9 of Joshua. Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him. So the children of Israel obeyed him and did as Hashem had commanded Moses. <laughs> oh my gosh. Nice. It's literally written as to who the prophet like unto Moses is. Verse 10 even goes on. It says, and there arose not a prophet since then in Israel like unto Moses. Oh, yes. Yeah. And yes. so that's specifically referring to yeah. Yehoshua. Specifically right? referring, yeah. yeah. And and again, and I, I, like to, I like to use common sense. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's How, awesome. So in, in the Christian in the Christian worldview, does this make any sense? Let's say that what Hashem really means by the prophet like unto Moses, and I, I apologize, I said Exodus and I meant Deuteronomy. Um, if it's if really the prophet that would arise like unto Moses was Jesus, then this is what you have to believe. All right, Hashem the master of legions, <laughs> the creator of the heaven. And I like to do the Hashem, master of legions. Could you do that in the voice of Charleston Heston, please? Um, that would be let's nice. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't even do that. How about, let's see, I could do Hashem, the master of legions. That would be... Um, Let uh, my the, people the, go. The, 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 yeah. Hashem. The master of legions, he'll let my people go. 
That's more like a James Bond type of a thing. There. That's funny. <laughs> anyway, if let's say, okay, God is speaking and he says, I'm going to raise up a prophet like Moses. Now, what I'm really hoping is since I'm going to be Jesus, I am really hoping to be like Moses. That's what I'm really hoping to be like. <clears throat> That's funny. In what in what bizarro world could that be true? In other words, if Jesus, according to the Christian church, Jesus is God. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so the creator of the heavens and the earth is hoping to be like Moses. Oh, if I can just be like Moses. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so then that would, would, if Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses, is he hoping to get divine prophetic word through from Moses? Uh, I guess. I, I don't know because he's hoping to be like Moses. But verse 10 of 34 kills it because. Never again has there arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses. Now the Christians will, Christians no will of course, Christians will say um, that that's because it hadn't happened yet. Which, but the the point is, oh my gosh! But the whole point of this of that thing is is that it's very clear that Yahushua, that Joshua, was the one that was it's spoken. Very of. clear. That's the whole. He point, was the one. Right? Okay, so he is the he is the one. He's the one who. The angel led to destroy the Canaanite nations. Um, that's Exodus 23 fulfilled in in uh, Joshua 12. So you can you can just you don't have to. I'm sorry. It is fulfilled in Joshua I have, 10. I have a few points, um, a few points I want but, to make before we get before okay. we close off. So. Okay. Uh, first point was uh, somebody in chat, and I don't remember who it was, it said that Greg should run for president. And I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am unelectable. <laughs> okay, so the other points is for Chantel and Ambrosio. Uh, so okay. uh, other other things, like, for example, uh, when Jesus, uh, you know, turned over table, tables in the temple and got angry, and then he cursed it. On another time, he cursed the fig tree. Another time, uh, whenever he was... Uh, um, whenever the whole idea of picking the grains of head, there, there's a lot of things you just have to know where to look in the New Testament where Jesus either did something, or but to be fair, Jesus never actually said anything. He never wrote anything no. down in the New Testament. No, Everybody else was writing write about anything. him, but the things yeah. written about him, uh, uh, there are yeah. a handful of things that actually are violations of Torah. And it's just prob the problem is Christians just don't know it, and the reason why they don't know it, right. it's not because they're stupid, it's because they've not studied no. Torah. If they just study it, no. they would, they would, they would, they would see it. You know what I mean? That's all. And yeah, and the Torah has been <clears throat> completely diminished in the church. I, like I just read in the third chapter of Galatians, who's going to worry about the Torah when Paul specifically says, "Oh, that, that schoolmaster, it's gone. You, mm -hmm. you don't need to worry about that schoolmaster." In another place, he says, "Oh, it's old, and old means that it's decaying and and going away." Well, that's that's everything. Do you really think that Gamaliel taught Paul that mm. the Torah was old and fading away? Next week's theme is going to be the exact same thing because I hear this from Christian apologists all the time. Oh, Paul was a student of Gamaliel. He really understood. Okay, I'm going to show you how Paul completely changes and turns on in not just the Torah, but the Tanakh as well. Nice. And nice. then you then then you can make a judgment. And please, again, I got a really thick skin. I could. <laughs> but it, it is kind of annoying. Uh, OK, when when all you do in the email to me or in the chat is say things like Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. And you'll burn in hell. Uh, well, you know, 
tell me why I'll burn in hell for right, not believing right, right. Jesus. Don't That's say what you're I fat. Don't say you're stupid. Don't say you're ugly. Don't let's say I'm t- stupid and ugly. Don't say I'm boring. Right. And I don't care if I'm boring. I might be boring. I don't know. Maybe right. I am. I don't think so. But, but <laughs> no, you're not boring <laughs> but at I all. Mean, uh, but if, but if, d- don't just make a personal attack on me. It's a little bit cowardly in a way. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I don't know you. If you come to my face and make a attack on me, that's a little different. You know, I can deal with that, but don't just be an anonymous, but, but I know that in the chat, when I, when I go through the chat, there's going to be tons of stuff about how, Oh, Paul was, Paul knew the Torah better than any scribe or Pharisee. Uh, Okay. Tell me how that can be because all and most of this stuff, I again, I like to read out of my stone edition because it's been translated by rabbi. I'm right? going to see if I can get a see if I can get something um, closer to the stone edition. Maybe maybe Art Scroll has a digital Bible I can download. If I do, if they oh, can, I bet they. If do. they do, I'll see what I can do about getting a copy of it here. So that would okay. be easier for yeah. me to follow. All right. Okay, my friend. Well, well thank great. you again. You're awesome. All I right. really appreciate it. Great show tonight as usual. <laughs> Guys, hit that like button. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please turn on notifications and share these videos with your loved ones. Y'all have a great night. Greg, love you, brother. Take care. Thank you. Love you Hello, too. my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K. Com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Shaifa